Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratories uh, Rock Talk Seminar Series. I'm Dr. David Buck, the Associate Director of the lab. For those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, Shoals Marine Laboratory is the largest and oldest uh, undergraduate focused marine laboratory in the country. Uh, the lab is jointly operated by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University and is located um, just a few miles off the shore of uh, New Hampshire here in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine. Um, the Rock Talk series um, provided, provides an opportunity for Shoals Marine Laboratory, our students, our staff, our faculty, and researchers um, and members of the wider community to come together for a seminar style lecture on current and emerging issues in marine science. Today will actually be um, our final seminar series of this calendar year. Uh, and we're already making plans for 2021 when we will pick up the seminar series again in the summer. So we hope to see you then as well. Um, our format for this afternoon is a 45 minute talk followed by a 15 minute question and answer. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, please also let us know through the Q&A box. Um, either myself or another Shoals staff member will be monitoring um, that stream and we'll try to help as best we can. So for today's Rock Talk, uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Nishad Jayasudandra, um, assistant professor with the school, within the School of Marine Science uh, at UMaine Orno. Um, Dr. Jaya Sudanda, the Sudara, excuse me, is the principal investigator of the Environmental Health Lab at UMaine Orno, where he directs research using a variety of techniques and study systems to explore uh, the impacts of contaminants and other environmental stressors on both environmental and human health. Um, he also monitors how organisms adapt under those uh, stressful conditions. So prior to coming to UMaine Orno, um, Nishad was a postdoctoral researcher at Duke University working within Duke's Superfund Research Center. Um, prior to that, he received his PhD in Biological Sciences from Stanford University and his BA in Human Ecology from the College of the Atlantic, also here in Maine. In addition to his research that really focuses at that nexus of toxicology and environmental health, uh, Dr. Jayasundara is um, active in applying the, the information that he learns from his research uh, in public health to issues that are current both in his home state of Maine and also in his home country of Sri Lanka. He's involved in several programs with school-aged children that are designed to educate students about the linkages between clean water and public health, two very important issues. Uh, so today, Dr. Jasundara will provide us with an introduction to one of his research systems uh, that examines a common estuarine fish's adaptation to local environmental contaminants and some of the potential trade-offs that are made as a result of, as a result of those adapt adaptations. Uh, so we are very pleased to have him participate in today's Rock Talk. And please join me in welcoming him. Nishad, uh, I'll pass you the virtual. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, again. And uh, thank you for the um, invitation to share some of this work. Um, really excited to be here and, and tell you about uh, these Atlantic killerfish that, that live in a, a highly polluted and toxic estuary where um, pretty much no other fish can, can live in. Um, I think we all understand the psychological impacts of this type of isolation these days, but uh, for these fish, it's, it's been um, a number of generations now, probably 50 to 60 years that uh, they've been the only species living in that, in that estuary. And it's exciting to think about these fish and tell you about these fish because um, they're giving us a glimpse of the types of stresses and, and um, the processes that takes to live, take to live in those types of uh, stressful environments. So we, are, we all know that um, future environmental habitats are going to look very different from what they are today. And these fish are uh, in many ways serving us as um, sort of the canneries in a coal mine. Uh, for us in, in thinking about how organisms are going to deal with the stresses in the future. Uh, some call these fish cockroaches of the sea because they can survive anything. So um, you can pick, pick your favorite metaphor for them, but they are pretty remarkable species to study. Um, so before diving too deep to tell you about killerfish, I want to give a quick introduction um, on the overall focus uh, of our research and training program. And uh, David mentioned a little bit about some of that work. 
Um, uh, so the central focus of what we do in, in the lab is to understand biological impacts, especially at the cellular and molecular level um, of perhaps the two of the biggest challenges that, that we face today, rapid environmental change due to chemical pollution and, and climate change. And for our studies, we've been using various fish species from around the world, from, from different habitats, um, especially fish that, that have evolved different strategies to live in challenging and, and unique and rapid, um, unique environments that are also rapidly changing, uh, especially in the last 20 to 30 years. So we study these fish to broadly examine two key questions. One is to um, understand uh, and, and determine biochemical and physiological consequences of response to changes in the natural environment. And, and the goal is to uncover the molecular mechanisms and pathways that are underlying those responses. And these, these studies provide us a really fascinating insight, um, fascinating insights into uh, basic fundamental biological processes, which is very important on its own, but also learning about these processes help us um, develop potential predictors of ecological consequences of environmental change and also human health consequences of environmental change. So based on what we learned from our comparative physiological analyses um, about the cellular and molecular mechanisms or drivers that govern how species um, live in stressful environments, we take that information and try to integrate that information uh, into habitat distribution models to figure out how a given population may shift in its habitat in the future. And that's the type of work that I want to uh, tell you a bit about today uh, and how we are doing that type of work, taking advantage of these killifish that live in this very polluted estuary. Um, as David mentioned, um, the other half of the lab is, is focused on informing human health questions related to chemical exposure. Um, and we do this work in, in the One Health Framework, a concept that I, I hope many of you are familiar with, uh, but uh, won't spend any time discussing that today, but happy to chat and, and discuss it with anyone. And before diving too deep to, to tell you about killifish, um, I wanna spend a few minutes highlighting an example uh, from my own backyard in, in Sri Lanka that inspired me to do this type of research. In, in case you don't know where Sri Lanka is, it's a small island in the Indian Ocean. It's a very beautiful place with a lot of biodiversity. Um, and growing up, my playground was, was a little creek that, that looked like this, uh, it's not this one. Um, that was right behind my house that was also right next to a paddy field where we grew our own rice. Um, and, and this creek eventually connected to an estuary that was about five miles south of where we live. Um, and it, it uh, was full of life. There was a lot of fish, at least four or five different species, a lot of other birds and snakes uh, that came to eat those fish. And there was me spending a lot of time in there. But over time, there was a lot more development. And, and this is what the creek looks like now. And obviously in the rice fields, um, everybody started using pesticides and that became highly prevalent. And with time, we started to see that the fish was no longer there and all the animals that were coming uh, and that completed the food web around this creek was also slowly disappearing. And I think, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these types of scenarios in your own backyards or at a global scale. And I just wanted to use um, this example to highlight uh, how much our ecosystem have changed in the last two to three decades. And that there is a lot of work for us to do at many levels to understand these impacts, as well as to find ways to predict what species may have the capacity to survive through rapid environmental change. So, so these killifish that I, I want to talk about today um, that have managed to survive and thrive in a highly polluted site is, is, quite, is a, quite a striking example and, and giving us a very exciting window into understanding the mechanisms that enable them to live in that, in that environment. So for the rest of the talk, uh, what I want to tell, do is to tell you a bit about evolving resistance to chemical pollutants and describe what we know about the mechanisms of how these killifish might be surviving in this environment. As well, and as well as talk about the consequences or costs of, of living in that environment. And finally, I want to spend a little bit of time um, on how these studies are highlighting a key role for mitochondria which is the energy powerhouse of the cell that I think we've all learned at some point um, in, in high school biology or, or some other context, that how we could use mitochondria as a marker, as well as a predictor of uh, potential environmental changes, uh, impacts of environmental changes. 
And, and I'd like to show a few slides on how we're beginning to do um, that type of work. So moving on to the first part, um, just to give you a bit of background on evolution to, to pollution, I want to first emphasize that, that we are releasing chemicals at an alarming rate uh, into our environment, where right now there are somewhere between 60,000 to 80,000 chemical compounds that are in circulation made by us. And I'm sure we are all very familiar with all the different terrible outcomes of chemical contaminants and how it impacts our health and also impacts the health of, health of the future generations. Uh, but one of the more intriguing outcomes of environmental pollution and environmental contamination is evolutionary adaptation to resist chemical toxicity. Of course, we often hear about plant species um, that have evolved resistance to herbicides or bacteria quickly evolving to resist um, antibiotics. Uh, but we are beginning to now find examples across all taxa um, that this might be occurring beyond these um, organisms in, uh, in and among vertebrates. Um, enough number of times that we can begin to think that this is not a coincidence anymore. Of course, theoretically, it is highly possible that an, a population can evolve to live in a contaminated environment, especially if that environment is a mutagenic chemical. Theory would predict that the exposure to that chemical will drive beneficial mutations that can lead to changes in genetic diversity of populations that can result in a beneficial mutation that would allow that uh, population to live in a new environment. There's also genetic drift and other mechanisms that, that can facilitate this type of evolved response. And when we really think about it, in, in many ways, this has been happening throughout evolution. Um, when you think about it, we, are, we or any organism is essentially a, a soup of chemical compounds where reactions are simultaneously taking place and we call that life. But I, I know that's that's a bit of a reductionist view of life, but in reality, um, ever since we've been a single cell, or even before that, organisms have always been evolving to thrive in the chemical environment around them and, and taking advantage of the compounds that are around them to create and, and evolve lives. But the key challenge in the last hundred years or so have been that we are changing the chemical environment around us at such a rapid pace and across many habitats um, at the same time taking away potential um, refugia for, for organisms to go and live in. So, so keeping up with evolutionary change to survive in these contaminated environments has been difficult. So when we see an example of that, such as in these killifish that I wanna talk about today, um, it, is, it, it is quite a unique example and gives us a, a really nice window into mechanisms and consequences of rapid evolution to anthropogenic stresses. Um, and to highlight some of the vertebrate examples that um, have evolved resistance to chemicals, there are mammalian examples in a population of rats that have evolved to live in a nuclear blast site, um, fish and frog populations inhabiting highly contaminated radioactive waste site and other highly contaminated dump sites. And a very striking example of this um, is in a community of people who live in the Andes in Argentina. Uh, these are um, Atacama people in the Andes that have evolved resistance to arsenic in their drinking water. Well, um, this is not an example of chemical resistance that's naturally occurring in this region. I want to quickly highlight uh, this example because how striking it is and, and it may suggest that perhaps there are other examples within different human populations that have also evolved mechanisms to deal with the chemical stresses that are around them. So the example I want to tell you about today is, is the killifish and how they've evolved resistance to, to this highly ubiquitous and persistent organic pollutant called uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. And I want to quickly mention that this work um, started during my postdoctoral research, and I'm continuing to develop this work in collaboration with uh, Rich DeGiulio's group at, uh, at Duke University. So to introduce you to what PAHs are, um, according to NASA, about 20% of our stardust is made up of PAHs. And some of the compounds look like these molecules with multiple benzene rings, and they're released from both natural and anthropogenic sources, um, including during uh, forest fires, and when you burn your burger, you're exposed to these chemicals. And I'm sure many of you are, um, or have become aware of these compounds since they make up 
uh, the petrochemicals that, that we have and we continue to accidentally release into our oceans through um, oil spill events. So these chemicals are, are everywhere and they're also highly toxic um, at certain levels and above certain levels and can cause um, DNA damage, developmental deformities, induce cancer, um, compromise behavior, immune function. So it's, it's a pretty uh, nasty and toxic contaminant and it's also highly ubiquitous um, around us. And in the early 1900s, these chemicals were used in wood treatment facilities and um, they added a lot of these PAHs uh, into the nearby estuaries. And one example of this is the Atlantic Wood Industry site in the Elizabeth River in, in Virginia, which is now a highly contaminated site with PAHs and is currently a designated uh, Superfund site by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, this site, the specific site is now being remediated, but a few years ago, if you go there and you'll see sort of this oil sheen on top of the water and you can actually smell uh, the PAHs, which is pretty terrible. So when some of you get to go to really beautiful places around the world to do field work, um, this, is, this is where I went quite regularly. And what's remarkable is that this site is home to a population of killifish and um, they've evolved complete resistance to PAH toxicity and, and thrive in this environment. And in some ways, this is not surprising because these fish live along the East Coast of the United States in estuarine habitats um, they can tolerate a wide range of fluctuations in temperature, salinity, um, oxygen levels, um, hypoxia, at times anoxia. Uh, sometimes they can even live outside of the water when some people forget to put them back in, in the tanks. And they've actually also been to space. Um, not sure exactly what the purpose of that trip was, but they, they were taken. So evolving to tolerate a chemical contaminant within 50 to 100 years may not actually be that surprising an outcome for these, uh, these organisms. But what's really neat is that um, they allow us to, to understand the mechanisms of this resistance, uh, potentially beyond the genetic modifications uh, that have allowed them to live in this environment, as well as the trade-offs uh, of this uh, rapid evolution. So one of the first things we learned about um, killifish from the contaminated site is that how resistant they are to developmental toxicity of PAHs. Uh, this work has been repeated over the last 20 years by many folks in, in the DiGiulio lab. And uh, we continue to see that fish that come from the contaminated site when exposed to a complex mixture of PAHs show complete resistance to any developmental effects of this chemical. What you're seeing here is a developing killifish embryo and uh, the three red bulbs that you see here, see here make up the fish heart. And what you're seeing in the bottom embryos is that um, when they're exposed to a, a chemical mixture derived from this highly contaminated site in the Elizabeth River, nothing really happens to their heart. Whereas if you go a few miles north and collect fish from a clean site from the same river, a, a, an uncontaminated site, and we expose those embryos to about 3% of the mixture that we derive from the contaminated site, what we see is that their heart becomes a strength. And obviously heart is no longer functional and these organisms eventually die. So these fish that are coming from the contaminated site have evolved this complete resistance. So now I want to show you some of our work and others research that, looks in, that looked into mechanisms of this pH resistance and uh, basically understand how do these fish do it. So a number of studies um, have looked into what the mechanism of this resistance is and have alluded to this one particular pathway that has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, this is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor pathway or the AHR pathway. And um, as the word suggests, it is a receptor for hydrocarbons and pHs are hydrocarbons. And in orange, I'm showing you this receptor in the schematic. And when a hydrocarbon, a PAH is bound to that receptor, it translocates into the nucleus. So it's going into the nucleus and binds to this other protein called the aryl hydrocarbon nuclear translocator, the ANT. And the combination of ANT and AHR can activate a series of genes that are involved in metabolizing that chemical itself. And these genes include things like cytochrome P450s, which are involved in, again, metabolism of these, these compounds as well as the number of genes involved in oxidative stress response. And many studies show that HR gene activity is altered in this pH resistant uh, killifish. 
And uh, there was a really nice recent whole genome sequencing study that showed that HR gene itself is different and is present in a chimeric form in the pH resistant population. So the overall conclusion is that this one particular receptor, by changing how that receptor works, uh, they've changed, these organisms have changed that pathway that allowed them to live in this highly contaminated site. So to further test this hypothesis, we turn to zebrafish. Um, we use zebrafish because you can easily genetically manipulate them. Uh, there's a large set of genetic tools available for them, information uh, we can easily find uh, in terms of what those genes do, uh, primarily because they're used as a common, commonly used as a human disease model. And they also breed in really large numbers. So we can do uh, massive exposure studies and also do a number of genetic manip manipulations quite easily and quite quickly. So what we wanted to do was uh, to see if zebrafish are also showing a similar cardiac deformity phenotype that we were seeing in killifish. So we exposed zebrafish to a chemical mixture we derived from the same contaminated site. And we indeed saw the same thing where their hearts didn't develop correctly and uh, they eventually died. Uh, and a good indicator of this um, cardiac deformity is, the, is what we call the pericardial edema. So this is where the zebrafish heart is lying. And if you see this edemic region, which is bigger than what we're seeing here, we can actually measure that under the microscope. And we know that uh, these zebrafish have been exposed to these contaminants and it's leading to cardiac deformities. So what we did was to recapitulate to a large extent, the phenotype we're seeing in the wild where killifish have figured out that down-regulating this one receptor can uh, live, allow them to live in this contaminated environment. We knocked down that gene within zebrafish. So we use a technique called the Mofalino technique where we knock down this one particular gene and uh, we expose them to a simple mixture of PAHs, uh, benzoate, pyrene, and florentine. And the idea is that if this gene knockdown is helping them uh, if, to see if that gene knockdown is helping them to rescue the toxic effect. And that's what we saw um, in that when we expose all of our embryos, the, the AHR knockdown embryo, the normal Mofolino embryo, the control Mofolino embryo, as well as the normal embryos, there, there was no knockdown. They didn't show any effect of exposure to our solvent, but when we exposed them to our chemical mixture, we see that the, the control Mofolino and the non-injected embryos show an increase in pericardial area, essentially their hearts were getting deformed. But when we knock down the AHR gene, we see that pericardial area is back to where it was normally. So this is uh, uh, in many ways a very elegant result, even though it's a very simple result, is showing that knockdown of this gene is completely rescuing the effect of uh, the chemical exposure. So given that we can now replicate what evolution has solved for killifish in the lab, we wanted to dive a bit deeper into the mechanisms underlying how this AHR downregulation, this receptor downregulation leads to pH resistance. And why do pHs even cause cardiac deformities? So we did a, a transcriptomic analysis, gene expression analysis of zebrafish hearts um, in the developing embryos. We were able to extract out tiny glowing zebrafish hearts um, that you can see in this picture. Um, following exposure at different time points during development with exposure to our chemical mixture as well as individual chemicals um, that we were exposing them to. And uh, essentially in this experiment, we had 32 different treatment groups, a massive gene expression data set and allowed us to tease apart how a PAH mixture induces cardiac toxicity, how is that different from individual compounds and what are some of the um, what are the impacts of HR down regulation that rescues that toxic effect? I won't go into all the details um, in, into uh, what we found, but I just wanna show you that our analysis indicated some clear differences between the gene expression signature from the HR knockdown group and the control knockdown group. And the biggest difference we saw happened um, in the really early time points. And the key take home point from this study was that PAH exposure, exposure to these chemicals disrupted calcium homeostasis and mitochondrial function in the cell. And we also found that HR knockdown can restore effects on calcium homeostasis, but not on mitochondrial function. If anything, HR knockdown had a larger effect on mitochondrial function. And as you can see, um, my, as you know, mitochondria are uh, the, the organelle that primarily controls cellular energy production and this was very surprising to us 
because we didn't know that AHR had a role in, in regulating or affecting mitochondrial function in any way. So we wanted to dive a little bit deeper. So we repeated our knockdown experiment. We downregulated AHR receptor in uh, saberfish embryos. We exposed them to that simple mixture of PAHs and also a complex mixture we derived from, from our field site and we measured mitochondrial function. And to do that, we developed this assay uh, that allow us to, allows us to do rapid mitochondrial measurements in developing fish eggs and fish larvae and, and also in fish tissues. And um, we use this instrument called the extracellular flux analyzer, which is um, either a 24 play, well played assay or 96 well played based assay and was developed to, to measure mitochondrial function in cell culture, but we've been able to now adopt it for our fish studies, so broadly environmental studies. So using this, what we can do is develop a graph that looks like this, what's in orange, where we can measure um, normal oxygen consumption rates under normal conditions, so basal oxygen consumption rate of a, an embryo or a larvae or a tissue. And then we can use different pharmacological inhibitors that affect mitochondrial function that allows us to look at um, certain parameters such as maximum mitochondrial respiration. And the difference between the maximum and the, and the basal level gives us an indicator of spare mitochondrial capacity. In other words, the capacity that these mitochondria may have to increase amount of energy that they produce if the demand starts to increase. We can also completely inactivate the mitochondria and measure the difference between oxygen consumed when the mitochondria are active and when they're inactive. So with this, type of different pharmacological manipulations, uh, we can get about five to six different parameters that give us an indicator of overall mitochondrial health of, a, of an egg or, or larvae or, or tissue. So using this approach, we measured mitochondrial function in embryos where H receptor was knocked down and the control knocked down, as well as following exposure to um, chemicals, uh, those pH mixtures. And the most interesting aspect we found from this was that AH receptor knockdown had the biggest effect. What you're seeing here is the amount of oxygen consumed by mitochondria in a developing embryo and the knockdown itself with no exposures to PAHs increased its uh, mitochondrial respiration capacity. And there were some effects that we were seeing with exposure to chemicals and a reversal of that or rescue of that effect with uh, BAP and fluorentine exposure. We didn't really see a lot of effects with uh, the, the large mixture we got from the field. But overall, we are, what we are seeing is that downregulation of this one gene, this AH receptor, is inducing significant changes in the mitochondrial function. So this made us wanted to think about uh, what does it mean for these fish? Uh, what we did here was just a transient knockdown. So we knock it down just during development and the gene comes right back up after a few days of, of development. So um, if we grow them up with normal age function uh, resuming in the, in the developing egg em embryo and then uh, to the rest of their life, we wanted to see does, that, does this early life embryonic knockdown that we are seeing having an effect on mitochondrial function, does that persist through life? So we grew those uh, embryos up in the lab under normal conditions for six months of age. We put them in our, um, what we call our fish treadmills uh, or more formally known as swim tunnels built by a Loligo respiration system. Uh, and this is a video that they've captured for a study that they were doing. And what we do is we put the fish in these tunnels and we can make them swim at different speeds and we can measure how much oxygen they consume when they're in, there, in these tunnels. And what we found was that um, all the treatment groups compared to our control knockdown maintained an increased basal metabolic rate in all of our zebra fish. So except um, for the, the control knockdown that, were not, that was not exposed to anything, everyone else had an impact. And remember, this exposure only happened once during their embryonic development. They spend the rest of their life under normal conditions. And this is showing us a significant effect on overall bioenergetics of these organisms. So in other words, we want to dig, uh, and because of that, we are seeing these large um, effects on mitochondrial function. We wanted to dig in and see if killifish um, if their solution to this pH toxicity is downregulation of this one receptor, which we're seeing is, is impacting their overall bioenergetics in zebrafish, is that repeated in the field? So we went back to studying our killifish and uh, we took two population genomics data sets that compared fish from 
clean sites and fish from pH resistant site, uh, pH contaminated sites where those fish are resistant to this toxicity. And we look to see what types of genes that might be under selection in this group, in, the, in these two uh, comparisons. And indeed we found that mitochondrial processes are under selection in killifish from the contaminated site. And among other processes, they are one of the most predominant um, pathway, set of pathways that were different, that were under selection and uh, many of the genes we found were involved in aerobic energy metabolism, including genes associated with regulation and function of mitochondria. And the, the figure here is, is describing a lot of those genes and I won't go through all the details, but um, this, is, this was rather surprising because even though we knew from our zebrafish studies that AH down regulation leads to mitochondrial differences, I didn't expect to see this many number of different genes associated with cell metabolism would be under selection because you would imagine that maintaining energy metabolic homeostasis in a new environment is perhaps the first strategy in surviving and thriving in a new environment, given how important energy metabolic processes are to, to maintaining overall fitness of an organism. So this prompted us to look at the transcriptome, uh, the overall changes in gene expression patterns between the two populations again, to see if energy metabolic processes are also impacted at the expression level. So we did a RNA-seq analysis comparing fish livers from two populations, the contaminated site and the clean site. And um, this is a heat map of our data where each line is a gene. And if the number of copies of a gene is decreased in pH resistant fish, it's in red. If it's increased, it's in uh, green. And I don't wanna again go into all the details, but I want to quickly highlight that about 8,000 different genes were differentially expressed between the two groups, but about 85% of those genes were downregulated in pH resistant fish. So there's a global suppression of gene expression in the fish that are coming from this contaminated site. And, and we also found in that suppressed gene category, many of the mitochondrial genes are also suppressed. So to look at where this global suppression might be coming from, in other words, are they genetically hardwired to suppress their gene expression or is it driven by some other epigenetic mechanism? So we focused on looking at changes in genome-wide methylation patterns. Just to explain that a bit further, methylation can change expression of a given gene by adding a methyl group to the upstream region of that gene and prevent it from being activated. So the more methylated your genome is, the fewer genes are expressed. And we wanted to study how killifish from the contaminated site may differ from the methylation signature in fish from the, um, contaminate, from the clean site. So we used a, a reduced representation by sulfite sequencing approach to look at this. And this is just to briefly show you the data. Uh, it's a principal component analysis of the two groups showing how pH sensitive fish has a very different methylation signature compared to fish from the um, pH uh, contaminated site. Um, the further apart dots are, the, the more different they are. And that's how um, I would interpret this uh, PCA plot. And essentially what we found was that the two groups are very different and also fish that come from the contaminated site had a strong hypermethylation signature. In other words, the overall methylation levels were higher in pH resistant fish, which complemented the global suppression of gene expression that we were seeing. So this is, quite, this is actually super interesting in some ways because this data is suggesting that uh, in addition to genomic processes, there are potential epigenetic modifications that are also playing an important role in maintaining this adaptive response to PAHs. So this metabolic gene expression suppression was surprising to see uh, because if anything, based on our data from zebrafish studies, we were seeing an increase in metabolic rate. But what we are seeing here is that everything is suppressed. And what we are wondering now is that if this is some kind of counteractive strategy, so as I said, with AHR downregulation in, in zebrafish, we see this increased metabolic activity, which can be costly because it leads to reduced spare energy, or it, it leads to a higher cost of living. So by potentially trying to suppress everything, overall metabolic activity, it might allow these organisms to maintain a lower cost of living in the environment. And this might be happening through epigenetic modifications. And this is a hypothesis we're interested in in following up, but before spending a lot of money in, in doing this, we wanted to know how persistent this suppression is. And if it's just a transient effect that we were seeing in 
fish that we catch from the wild, or if these effects actually persist into the next generation. So a doctoral student, Dr. Casey Lindbergh in Richard Julia's group brought fish back to the lab, uh, both from the clean site and the contaminated site and spawned them, read those eggs with and without pH exposure at a mild concentration of pHs. Of course, otherwise the, the fish that come from the clean site would, would not make it. And, uh, Lin, uh, and Casey extracted RNA at seven days during development and 14 days during development and um, generated a transcriptomic data set that, we, um, that we've been analyzing. And what this study is essentially telling us is that how gene expression levels are changing during development, both in pH resistant fish and uh, fish from the clean site, and how the exposure to these contaminants might be impacting that change. So just to show you what we found, uh, especially focusing on mitochondrial function again, Fish that came from the clean sites, if you compare their 14 day time point, which is shown in blue here, the, the difference between exposed and unexposed fish in terms of the mitochondrial genes, there were 88 genes that were differentially expressed. Whereas at 14 days in the pH resistant fish, there was only one gene that was related to mitochondrial function that were differentially expressed. In other words, the pH resistant fish are recalcitrant to the effects of pHs and how they might impact mitochondrial function compared to fish that are coming from the, the sensitive population. And when we compare resistant fish with sensitive fish, we see that many of the mitochondrial genes are downregulated in uh, fish that are coming from the uh, contaminated site as we were seeing in fish livers as well. So what this is telling us is that pH resistant fish are potentially hardwired in a way that they can resist effects of exposure to gene expression um, levels for that, that are responsible for mitochondrial function, as well as um, the, the uh, difference between the contaminated and the clean side fish is very similar to what we were seeing in the parental generation as well. So obviously what we want to do next is to go look at the methylation signature in these fish, and we are uh, beginning to do that now. Uh, but before um, go, telling you about that, that research, which I won't have time to talk about today, I want to show you two other um, to other studies that we were able to do. Because we were seeing this metabolic suppression at the gene expression level, uh, we wanted to know if that's actually reflected at the phenotypic level. We know that genes make the proteins that, make, that runs the metabolic machinery. So we wanted to look at metabolite levels. So we collaborated with Dr. Claudia Gunch and her uh, student, uh, Lauren Redfern, who's also actually now is Dr. Redfern. Um, and, and we looked at the, the total metabolite levels uh, and what we found was that many of the metabolites that we looked at, amino acids, acylcarnitines, glycerophospholipids, were indeed suppressed in pH resistant fish, just like what we expected based on our gene expression data. A bit of a side story here is that we, we found a couple of exceptions. And one of those was that we found that a group of lipids called sphingolipids were actually present at a higher level, unlike all the other metabolites in these pH resistant killifish. Among other processes, these sphingolipids are involved in building a, a mechanical barrier to prevent entry of xenobiotic elements such as pHs. So it was, in some ways, it's not surprising that these lipids, li lipid levels were actually one of the only metabolite types that were higher because they might be providing some protection against pHs. But interestingly, we also found another parallel, in another parallel data set we generated with the same fish that looked into the gut microbiome of these pH resistant fish, which showed that there's a high prevalence of sphingobacteria, bacteria that can produce those sphingolipids are higher in fish that are living in this contaminated site. So what this is indicating to us is that even though at the, at the epigenetic and the, and the transcription level, they're suppressing this one particular type of lipid, at the metabolite level, it's higher potentially because the gut microbiome might be contributing those lipids to the organism that enable them to provide to gain some protection against these uh, pHs in their environment. And we obviously wanted to look to see if this had any um, functional effects. So we examine mitochondrial function using the same method that we described earlier, but this time we measured it in um, intact beating fish hearts. And what we found was that killifish that came from the contaminated site didn't really show any difference in their cardiac mitochondrial function. Um, if anything, their mitochondrial function was actually doing better in providing a larger spare capacity. In other words, capacity to produce 
more energy if the demand increases. Um, and this is what this is telling us is that even though metabolite levels were suppressed, they might still be able to, and that's allowing them to, that suppression is allowing them to maintain a low enough metabolic rate that gives them a, a similar type of, or similar level of spare respiratory capacity, just like fish that are coming from the clean side. But one caveat here is that we did this study at 24 degrees Celsius, and given these animals experience thermal fluctuations in their environment, we wanted to see if this capacity actually holds up if we do the same study at a higher temperature. So we, we did the same analysis and what we found was a significant reduction is this in the spare capacity at a warmer temperature. So we also looked at the whole animal metabolic function, just like in the swim tunnel study that I showed earlier, which also showed the same results. Essentially what this is telling us is that suppression of metabolic processes are likely benefiting under less stressful conditions and is mediated by changes at the epigenetic and at the transcriptional level. But when there's a secondary stressor, such as a thermal stress, that requires you to increase their spare capacity, these animals that are coming from the polluted site aren't able to do it. So what I'm showing here with these two orange bars is that this suppression of, or this reduction of spare capacity in fish from the contaminated site. So overall, what, the, what these petrosis and killifish are indicating to us is that genome-wide modifications associated with rapid evolution will enable animal to live in new environments, even for a vertebrate species, but this type of rapid adaptation disrupts fundamental physiological homeostasis. And this disruption of homeostasis can potentially be re restored or rescued by epigenetic modifications or potentially facilitated by shifts in the gut microbiome. But Despite these counteractive effects, we also see that um, when the demand increases, when there's a secondary stressor, that, uh, that initial counteractive strategy may actually be less beneficial. So in many ways for these killifish, while they live in and thrive in this highly contaminated site, it seems there's a long way for them to go to become their sort of the normal killifish cells again. Uh, but one aspect that's become quite clear from these studies is that mitochondria seem to be quite important. And of course, we always knew that about them uh, as, a, as the energy powerhouse of the cell. But through this work, it's become clear that mitochondria might be, a, might be playing a significant role in mediating um, potentially overall ecological fitness of a population. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of that work that's been going on um, in our lab. As I mentioned over the last decade, it's become clear that, that mitochondria are in many ways their own being inside the cell and, and they play a wide array of roles um, in addition to regulating energy metabolism. They directly communicate with the nucleus involved in maintaining calcium homeostasis, um, number of cell signaling processes has their own quality control system where they undergo mitophagy, which means they, they self-destruct and they can remake themselves, biogenesis. Um, they have their own stress responses uh, and, and there's quite a diversity in how mitochondria organize their architecture within the cell. So a key part of my lab now has been, especially a research by a PhD student, uh, Akhila Harish Chandra, is to examine overall mitochondrial plasticity um, in an organism under thermal stress as an indicator of, of capacity of killifish, killifish to respond to a, a temperature change. And um, I don't wanna spend a lot of time discussing their work, but I quickly wanna highlight in a couple of minutes what um, Akila has been doing. What he's been doing is, is using killifish as a model to develop species distribution model that integrates mitochondrial plasticity to hopefully better predict where killifish might end up in the future with um, ocean warming events or with changes in, in temperature in the coastal habitats that these animals are living in. And the overall goal is essentially be able to link physiological capacity to acclimate of a given organism to how we predict species distribution. And we are also collaborating with Professor Viji Shu, who's an oceanographer at the School of Marine Sciences at UMaine, and, and she's been an incredible help in developing this work. So for the modeling approach, we are using this Arrhenius equation that's been used in, in a number of ways to link ecology and physiology of organisms. And this equation allows us to essentially estimate size dependent metabolic rate of a given organism at a given temperature. As you can see in the equation, we can predict metabolic rate um, as a function of 
a body mass dependent constant, which is A, P is the ambient temperature, K is the Boltzmann constant, and E is the biochemical activation energy. And if we know the E value, this biochemical activation value for a species, and their habitat temperature, we can calculate metabolic rate for a given organism, so in this case for killifish. And essentially we can hindcast metabolic rates for the last 20 years, if we know the temperatures the last 20 years, we can also forecast how the metabolic rate would shift in the future with ocean warming events. And if we know, um, if we can predict coastal temperatures and how they would change, we can actually figure out how metabolic rates might shift in killifish um, in, in their environment. And a key assumption of our model is that if the metabolic rates were to increase in their current habitat, they would move north to an environment where metabolic rates go back to where they were. Unless, the, if the organism can manipulate this E value, this biochemical activation energy through acclimation of metabolic processes, then the impact of the, the future temperatures may be lower on metabolic rates. And past studies using this equation in many contexts have always used a constant E value for all fish. But Achilles' work is showing that this E value is not only species dependent, it's even within a species, it depends on the thermal history of the animal and, the, and the, the population that they belong to. In other words, killifish in Maine in the summer would have a very different E value from killifish in the winter and a killifish from Florida. And even a small change in, in E value can have significant effects on metabolic rates of the organism. So what we're doing now is integrating this variation around the E value per given species, in this case, um, for, for killifish, of course, and we, which we can estimate uh, based on our own studies and, and previous studies, and use that E value in this Arrhenius equation and use that to predict how metabolic plasticity through acclimation may change the, the shift in these killifish populations with changes in the temperature. And once the framework is developed, hopefully we can use it for other species as well, um, as long as we can measure mitochondrial function at different temperatures, which is tricky, but with the, uh, the seahorse flux analyzer assay that I described earlier, we can do this in, um, in large numbers right now for a given population. So this is shaping out to be a, a really neat hypothesis for, for Aquila, and I'm really excited to see where he goes with it. But I want to quickly show you some of the preliminary data we've generated based on existing data. And what you see in figure A is that um, overall, killifish distribution along the east coast of the United States. And um, a red color means there's 100% probability that you would find those fish in that site. And with traditional approaches where we would predict that the species would move north to a equal thermal habitat, uh, we see that killifish would, would populations would start to uh, move northwards. But if we can account for plasticity as shown in figure D here, what we see is that the that there's more likelihood of species range expansion as opposed to a complete shift towards the north, as well as the, the constriction from the southern boundaries become a lot less. And at this resolution, you can't quite see it, but there are populations that are actually moving south, depending on their previous thermal history in the summer, if the temperature change were to happen uh, later in the summer versus earlier in the summer. So with that, um, I want to end by going back to what I said in the beginning, um, as we're subjecting our ecosystems to multiple stresses, organisms such as these killifish, um, they provide a really important window into how different biological processes will change in response to these multiple stresses. And, is, and these killifish are helping us understand the potential different strategies that'll come into play that help an organism to live in that new environment. That not just their own genomic uh, modifications or flexibility within their genome, but other types of processes that can play a role in allowing these animals to live, at least survive in these new environments. And as I mentioned, we can use some of these processes, especially mitochondrial function as a potential a predictor of what's in the store for these organisms, um, potentially uh, across taxa because how conserved mitochondrial function is among vertebrates. And, and they may also serve as a, a marker, which I didn't talk about that work, uh, because they have their own cell membranes and DNA that, can, that are susceptible to changes that are happening in the environment. So both a marker and a predictor of what's in the store for organisms as environmental, environmental change start to take place. So overall, I hope um, what I've just shown you uh, made you think a little bit about and appreciate the incredible complexity of interactions that are taking place that enable 
uh, species to survive in some of these challenging habitats and, and how it's giving us a glimpse into what might be happening um, into the future. So with that, I want to thank um, all of you for listening in and joining in and uh, want to, want to be very thankful to everyone in my lab at UMaine who have been an incredible group of students and people to work with. I feel very lucky. Um, and also all the collaborators and advisors for all their support, especially the Julio group. Um, and many thanks to the funding organizations that funded various aspects of the projects that I just talked about. And thank you again for, for joining and I'll take any questions. Nishad, thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. You know, the, the killifish has a long history of study at, at Shoals Marine Lab, mostly um, focused on their unique behavior in tide pools. Um, so you gave us a, a perspective that we don't oftentimes get when we're looking at their behavior in, in tide pools, a very different scale of, of looking at these, these great fish. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there are there are some questions that are popping up. Give me a minute just to get myself organized here. Um, there's a question from uh, Dennis Chastine, who, which you might see in the chat. He's he's asking a a, a quick question about uh, one of your earlier studies that you presented on um, how is oxygen consumption measured in the assay of mitochondrial function. Yeah, so this is uh, an instrument developed by Agilent Biotechnologies, and we've actually gotten um, the funding's full disclosure to develop this work uh, in for, for zebrafish and for killifish, and uh, we developed it for medaka and um, gambusier, so a mosquito fish. And uh, essentially, they have a, 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 protect, a patent protected probe that they won't exactly tell you how it works, but um, it's, a, it's a sensor, fluorophore, that can measure the amount of oxygen dissolved in um, less than 100 microliters of volume. And you could also detect, I didn't show that work at all, also detect the amount of protons in the water uh, as well. So you could actually get a sense of ex extracellular or extra um, uh, within an embryo, how much protons are leaking outside of that embryo as an indicator for gly uh, glycolysis. Uh, we don't think it works well for embryos, but it's something that people are using quite heavily for cell culture studies. Essentially, uh, there are two probes measuring proton levels and dissolved oxygen levels, and um, a lot of kinetics that are going into the cal eventual calculation, but um, it's uh, at the essence of it is it's microrespirometry, but the way that they build the instrument and we've been able to manipulate it, we can now do this uh, type of work in larvae and, and uh, fish eggs and uh, fish tissues. I don't know if that answered, the, if that's what they were asking. Yes, I think so. I think he was, he was interested in the actual instrument and, yeah. and how it's done. So that was great. Thank you. Um, I've got a, another question from uh, Carrie Keo um, down in Georgia. It's, she says, it sounds like thermal stress tolerance is one trade-off with resistance. I'm curious if there are other trade-offs you're exploring. For example, I wonder if the PAH resistant fish would be less resistant to parasite infection or whether so many of the normal ecological interactions are disrupted in these contaminated sites that parasites aren't a significant stressor. Yeah, really good question. And, and something um, we, we'd love to think more about because when we try to grow these fish in the lab, they don't do so well. So we, uh, one of the PHS we use called BAP, benzoapyrene. So we, we joke around the lab saying that they need vitamin BAP to survive in, <laughs> in their environment. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why they're not doing so well is that they're much more susceptible to infections in the lab compared to the clean side fish that we bring in. We start to see their fins start to rot after about two generations. Uh, so the first generation is okay, which, which is telling us there's some maternal transfer of signaling that's continuing to uh, enable them to induce whatever the um, mechanisms necessary to live and, and fight off those infections. But as they get to the second and the third generation, they, they don't do so well. Uh, but it seems like that um, in their natural environment, when the, where the contaminants are present, they don't seem to be susceptible to any parasitic infections. Um, having said that, I have not um, looked very carefully into see what types of parasites might be um, infecting these animals and how different they are between the two, two populations. 
There's a lot of work by Charlie Rice, who's at South Carolina, um, I think Clemson, uh, that's uh, really looking into the uh, mechanisms of how immune function might be altered because of this change in age receptor. So there's a lot of studies in human health and, and mammalian literature showing that age receptor is also quite heavily involved in immune responses. So it will be natural to see that these animals by changing this one key receptor are also susceptible. And what we think might be going on is that in the field, their age receptor is activated from having that chemical. Therefore, they can still produce the same type of immune responses. But when we try to grow them in the field, in the lab under clean conditions, the receptor is so downregulated, they don't have the mechanisms to activate it that compromises their immune function. But again, it's, it's uh, uh, some ways a wild hypothesis at this point, but would love sure. to explore more. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that answer. Um, I have another question here from uh, Mike Sigler out on the West Coast. He, he asks, um, by studying mitochondria plasticity in response to climate change effects, you imply that this is a dominant factor in affecting future species distributions. Uh, maybe a naive question, but why do you think mitochondria plasticity will be so important for their future locations? That's a fantastic question. And I, I think it's something we think a lot about. And um, a lot of the focus of uh, Akila, the student that I mentioned, uh, is, is diving deep into understanding this. And I think the, the overall premise behind this approach is that um, we studies have gone on for many years looking at overall metabolic rate and metabolic function as uh, the key player in determining energetic fitness of a given organism. So metabolic rates of a whole animal have been used as a, a, a predictor of how an animal is able to produce enough energy or um, allocate energy towards their other processes, growth and reproduction um, as a proxy or an indicator of fitness of the organism. But when you really drill down, what is driving that metabolic phenotype is it's the mitochondria. So where I would really argue is that, is it mitochondria or not? It's not on whether it's mitochondria or not that's driving the future distribution. Is it energetics that's driving future distribution? Is it that, uh, is it important that a fish is able to maintain um, a, a, a certain level of homeostasis within their cellular systems that enable them to produce the amount of energy that they need to live in their environment, as well as increase that energy production if needed or allocated mm -hmm. in a way that it goes towards growth and reproduction. So, um, and, and I think there's a lot of debate around that. And I, I totally agree with the, with the idea that um, you may have all the energy you need, but if you don't have food, your food source disappeared, that'll sure. obviously play, a, play the, the ultimate role. Or there's a new invader in town, or there's a new infectious uh, agent that are coming in. So um, by no means we're saying that mitochondrial plasticity will be uh, the driver in where species are going to be in the future, but it's going to be the driver in overall energetic function as a species. So by understanding the plasticity of mitochondria, we can start to get an idea about energetic plasticity of those species. But obviously there has to be a lot more other types of modeling work or, or theoretical work uh, and experimental work they'll have to go into to knowing how is that now connected to the actual um, population distribution changes that would happen. Sure. Uh, there's a, a question maybe partially related to that um, about sort of body mass. Um, Jen CV actually asked a question here with, with climate change, we see fish body size decrease, which would reduce the body mass dependent constant. Um, did they vary that in creating any of the models? And um, I, I lost you for a second, David. Sorry, could you repeat the question again? I, I apologize. Sometimes Sorry, this yeah. microphone can be can be frustrating. Um, so, with climate change, we see fish body size decrease, which would um, reduce the body mass dependent constant. Right. Um, so she's asking, did you vary that in creating any of the models? Yes, absolutely. That's a really good question, and and um, one of the areas we are struggling with the model is that how constant is that variation is. And um, I didn't show this data set. We have a, a paper that we recently published showing how uh, body mass scaling with metabolic rate with whole animal um, across five different species, how is that scaling? And how is that scaling correlated to 
metabolic scaling of mitochondria in heart tissues of these fish. And what we find is that within a certain size range, heart scales identically to overall uh, metabolic rates of the animal. But when you go outside of that range, that scaling gets disrupted and it's not predictable across the five species that we've looked at. So um, it, in killifish, we know within what range that we can still predict, um, at least reasonably predict within a certain body size a range to say at this body size, this is how it would scale with metabolic rate. Outside of that range, for example, for larvae, uh, we're just beginning to get that type of data. Somewhere between larval, um, larval stage to really early, you know, within one, four, 14 weeks to one month age, we have no idea what's what's happening because they're too big to go in our spirometer. Yeah. Micro spirometer, too small to go in the in the big spirometers we have. So, uh, so for killifish, we're just beginning to even understand within life history how the the size um, variation might play a role in driving metabolic rates, but. I think there's a huge field out there, as, as many of you are familiar with, on body size scaling, and that there's debate around this number on is it 0.75 scaling or not. Uh, what we are finding is it's highly species specific, and what we are, what Aquila is finding is just by simulations that E value depends a lot on body size, so it's really important that we account for size variation um, in all of these uh, modeling work that that we are trying to do. Um, the assumption we are making is that size variation would be the same across all populations across the United States, which may not be true because uh, the counter gradient variation that you see between Northern and Southern population. So, um, sure. but it's a, obviously a, an approximation that we have to do. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for that answer. You know, there, um, unfortunately we are at that one o'clock hour and okay. I, I want to respect everyone's time. I've, there's a, there's a host of other questions, Nishad, and I'm, I'm wondering if you would be willing, uh, time permitting, to maybe, if people want to reach out to you to ask other questions, would you be willing to field those questions over email? Um, that'd be, thank you very much. For Absolutely, being willing. yes. Yeah. I, I would love to, and and uh, if folks want to stay and, and chat, happy to do that as well. And uh, however that, that you'd like to structure the rest of the, yeah. Okay, questions. great. Well, yeah. thank you. You know, killifish are, are definitely close to the hearts of many Shoals Marine Lab alums yes. and students. So yeah. <laughs> thank Which you is very why much. It was very exciting to talk about that work <laughs> with you guys. So. That's yes. great. Well, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of what I, I know is a very uh, busy time of the year for you. So thank you very much. And I want to thank all of our, our guests this afternoon as well for joining us. Um, this in, uh, in unfortunately marks the end of our seminar series for this calendar year. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed their time with us today. We look forward to seeing everyone again next year. And Nishad, um, also good luck in your in your next phase of your career. For everyone that's not aware, he's, he's about to move to Duke University to continue on with this work. So we wish you all the best in your in your move back to Duke and, and North Carolina. So take good care and uh, hope everyone stays healthy out there. Um, and please join me in thanking Nishad for, for a fascinating talk today. Thank you, David. Thank you very much.